Okay, um, so hi everyone, uh, and welcome to, to my talk, uh, Pair Programming. Well, uh, so first of all, um, who am I? Um, well, my name is Pedro Torres, um, I'm Portuguese, I'm currently working in Portugal, and I think uh, I discovered Agile and Scrum around uh, 2010. Um, I got so excited when I discovered all of this that uh, basically I took uh, all the certifications I could, <laughs> although they are not that, that meaningful. Um, I took a couple of certifications from Scrum Alliance, and I even took one from Scrum Org. Um, well, basically, that, that's pretty much it. Um, although, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm one of the, of the few that say that experience is much more important than actually having a a certificate that doesn't tell a lot about you. Um, so currently I'm working at a Portuguese company based in Porto, it's called Blip. Uh, I'm a delivery manager over there, so I kind of can blend between being a kind of a scrum master and also a team leader, that kind of thing. And, and yeah, I believe that we are probably the, the most agile company in Portugal, which, which is pretty good, so I'm, 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 today I'm really happy working at, at, at my company. Uh, but previously, before actually working at Blip, uh, I worked in a couple of, of companies before, so I'm probably working now for like 14 years or so. Uh, I bet you all know this one here, because it has the, the office in, in, in Portugal as well. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> a lot of learning there. Um, so I, I've worked in, the, in London as well, in Sky, um, really, really interesting company, so it was kind of... Uh, eye-opener working in abroad, something that I advise everyone to do. Although living there is total crap, uh, working abroad is really interesting. Um, and then pretty much I've worked in Lisbon and now I'm back in Porto. And that's pretty much where, where I am today. Well, if I could define myself in just one sentence, um, th that would probably be the, the sentence I would pick. Um, I'm really enthusiastic about Agile. I'm an Agile geek. That's usually how I present myself to, to the people that work close to me. Um, and yeah, and I love to do this sort of stuff. Um, it all began in 2012 in a couple of Portuguese events. Uh, then I was super fortunate to actually be with you guys last year in Bilbao. Uh, then again, Portugal. I was invited to go to Brazil. Uh, and I'm here today. Um, and I really love this sort of conference because probably you don't realize that, but in Portugal we are just about 100 people and that's pretty much it. So when you go to a conference where you have more than 500 people, that's, that's really, really overwhelming. It's, it's really interesting and, and I learned a lot from, from doing this stuff. Okay, but enough about me. So let's talk about, uh, about pair programming. Um, and I'll, first of all, I've brought you um, a video, a really, really short video. Just for you to have a, take a look uh, and try to decide for yourself without me saying anything about pair programming, if what you're about to see is something similar or close to the idea of what you have about pair programming. No way. I'm getting hacked. A port scheme? No, no, this, this is, is from major. a really well-known TV show, NCIS. NCIS. Well, I should like to know uh, so basically, you have someone working on a workstation, I'm doing something, um, <laughs> and then you have two guys on the same keyboard, which is fantastic. I can't. The point so it seems like they are really engaged and really looking to do something that I really don't know what, but they, it seems to be working somehow. Then you have a guy eating a sandwich, which always helps someone when someone is in trouble. It's really refreshing to see that. I've never seen code like this. And all of a sudden... Where'd it go, Abby? I didn't do anything. I thought you did. No. I did. You have the old guy that pulled the plug. That's pretty much it. Uh, so do you think this is pair programming, kind of? I know this is really goofy, but it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like one keyboard, two guys working on this side of the keyboard, the other person working on that side. No, it's complete nonsense, right? Um, so the, you can actually find this video on YouTube. If you search for two idiots, one keyboard, you'll find the video. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that the name of the video says it all. <laughs> so definitely, that is not pair programming, something completely Hollywood silly. Um, 
Well, so, okay, um, I'm here to talk about pair programming, uh, but pair programming doesn't exist just because. So um, I'm not going to talk a lot about extreme programming, but extreme programming is a really interesting and fascinating agile tool that you all can use if you want. Um, and I think that it's fair to say that the main difference between extreme programming and Scrum is that besides all those iterations and all that thing that we all get it and it's really, really good, is that on top of that, they subscribe a lot of practices that what extreme programming says is, okay, if you actually adopt these practices, your chance of, of succeeding is much greater than if you don't actually adopt them. Uh, inclusively, my, my Scrum trainer wrote a book recently where he says that he can't imagine a world where Scrum can actually succeed or behave properly without at least pair programming and continuous integration. Um, and if you actually take a closer look to this, probably the vast majority of you already know of the, about some of them, and probably you are already doing some of them. Like for instance, the planning game, you have the planning sessions or the, the planning meetings. The continuous integration is something that is well known. Well, collective ownership of code, coding standards, test-driven development, I bet everyone knows about that one. Refactoring, uh, keep stuff simple, have a sustainable pace instead of actually sprinting. Um, and yeah, and we have this one here, that's the one we are talking about today, pair programming. Um, so yeah. What is pair programming? So uh, by definition, without any sugar coating, so just what it is, it's nothing more, nothing less than two guys, two developers on the same workstation doing a feature or a task at a time. That's it, so you have one workstation, two guys working on the same task. Not on the same keyboard, <laughs> at least not at the same time, but yeah, but on the same task. And that's, that's pretty much it, that's what pair programming is. Uh, pair programming has one thing that is really, really interesting, is that it defines basically two roles. So one role is a driver, okay? So the driver basically has the cool stuff to do. Uh, he's the, the one that writes the code. So when you're working next to another person, one of the guys is, is doing the code, while the other one, the navigator, is basically the one that is reviewing the code, is giving tips, is the person that's going to try to help you and allow some sort of discussion, brainstorming on the best implementation. So it's the person that is not actively touching the keyboard. So basically you have one doing the, key one doing the code and another one kind of reviewing the code, that's it. And both of you need to get to some sort of agreement on everything that you're going to implement. That's pretty much it. So now, after you guys knowing the rules, you're probably thinking, okay, so Probably I can actually imagine myself as being the driver. That's pretty much what I do every single day. But I'm not so sure about being the navigator because if I'm going to be the navigator for the full day, that sounds a little bit boring, right? Because even when sometimes we need to go to a code review for let's say one hour or two, that's really boring. Now imagine all day doing code reviews. Doesn't make a lot of sense. That's why that's one of the best recommendations uh, when you're actually going to try pair programming. Is that inside these two roles, you should change the rule multiple times a day. So let's say you code for two hours or something like that, or you can actually write a class and then you pass the keyboard to the other person or the other person is going to be the driver. And basically, you're going to be the driver and the navigator multiple times a day. So to make sure that people are fresh, engaged and motivated to do the work. Um, I know for instance companies that actually what they do is one guy writes the test, the other one makes it pass, then the one that makes it pass writes the test, and then the other one actually makes it pass. So it's kind of integrating TDD on this, on this uh, change role thing. So yes, you should change multiple times a day just to make sure that you keep engaged and motivated. And if you actually do that, it's, it's fine, and, and it, it, wo it works pretty well. Pair programming is a really powerful tool. Um, so now that you know what pair programming is, uh, at least I love quizzes. Uh, do you guys love quizzes? Raise your hand if you love quiz, like can you know that sort of TV show thing? Yeah, everybody loves quizzes. So <laughs> I'm going to present four scenarios, okay? And uh, the thing is, I'm going to ask you if on those scenarios you think that they are actually pair programming after the definition that I gave you or if they are not actually pair programming, okay? So scenario A, you have two young gentlemen uh, doing some code. Each one has its own laptop. Scenario B, uh, 
you have two guys uh, working together, really, really close, with one laptop. Uh, you have scenario C, where basically, uh, okay, they have two laptops, but this guy is really paying attention to what the other guy is doing. And you have scenario D, where you have two guys on one workstation. Well, they are not that close together, so that seems quite quite okay. They are kind of respecting the <laughs> the personal space of each other, which is which is quite healthy. So scenario A, do you think they are pair programming? Nope, you're right. So scenario B, by definition, uh, yeah, but okay. So let's not forget about personal space, okay? So it's, it, here's your first tip: don't forget about personal space. It's really really important. Um, on scenario C, what do you think? Uh, no, not really, because they, they are, well, if, if this guy was not wearing a laptop, not holding a laptop, then yes, definitely, but, it, yeah, if he's reviewing, but what I, I, I usually I kind of think is, okay, so they are both doing a task, each one, and then he's reviewing it, so it's kind of a, a cheating thing, but yeah, if it's just, I don't know, just watching Facebook or so, then yes, pair programming, definitely, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so I can say that, no, and then scenario D, what do you think? Okay, one workstation, two guys, personal space. Why not? Yeah, that's right. See, you're good at it. <laughs> so, um, one thing that usually people think, it's okay, so I want to start pair programming, so how can I actually do it? Uh, it's really hard. I always have a sort of setup. What do I need to start? Um, and basically, it's, it's really easy, right? And, and you're going to see that's, that's not that expensive as you might think. So, to do pair programming, that's pretty much what you need. You don't need a Mac, by the way. This is just because it's even prettier than, than a regular PC. But yeah, you just need a monitor and, and the keyboard. That's it, a workstation done. So actually, you're, sa you're saving some money because if you have two developers, you need to pay for two computers or two your workstations. And in this case, you just need one. So yay, <laughs> you save a couple of, of euros. Uh, <laughs> so this setup, it's not my perf uh, favorite one, uh, basically because if you have just a monitor, uh, well, your personal space kind of goes away because you are both trying to see what's happening on the monitor. And if you actually want to change the roles between the driver and the navigator, you're passing the keyboard around, which is not that nice. Although, for instance, uh, I know some teams that like to pass the keyboard because it's kind of representing that the role is going to be changed. I don't know. That sort of stuff. But I, I really don't like that. Um, this one for me ma makes much more sense. Okay, So you have two keyboards, so you don't need to have the, the lousy keyboard going around which is much more comfortable. Because at the end of the day, remember, you need to be comfortable, right? So if you're working close to one person, you, you can't be on top of her. It's, you don't need to pass stuff around. Just, just try to make stuff easy. <coughs> this one here, it's pre pretty much cool, cooler than the other ones. Um, but the thing is, when you're using two monitors, that's the, the kind of setup that I prefer, two monitors, you need to have the monitors mirrored, okay? So don't fall into the temptation of having uh, your ID and your awesome code here and some sort of lousy documentation over there because if you're, you're actually pairing, both of you must look to the exact same thing. So this should be a mirror of that one or cloning that one, okay? So don't, don't, don't try to split stuff because that, that will not work, but you'll find that, figure that out if you try it. <laughs> So, and this is definitely my favorite one, okay? So two keyboards, two monitors, everybody's comfortable, everybody's seeing exactly what the other person is doing. Um, so yeah, that's definitely what you need, that's it. So, okay, uh, let's say that you're pairing, um, and one of the questions that usually people do is, okay, but when should I pair? Uh, should I pair all the time or not? Uh, I don't know. Um, and at least in my opinion, in my personal experience, yes. Every time you're actually in front of the computer, you should pair. Um, because if you're thinking if you should pair or not, what is going to happen is that in the vast majority of the day or in some parts of the day, you're going to waste a lot of time discussing if you should pair or not. That doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion. So basically, you have the setup, you have your place in, in your place to, to, to do the work, so it's, to me it's a no-brainer. If you're in a pair programming team, you basically program all the time, that's it. Well. Obviously, if you go to a meeting, you know, don't need to, to go in pairs, right? Like, <laughs> that's something that it's really, really not necessary. And even more important, even if this is really close, you don't need to pair on that as well, okay? So each person can go to the bathroom <laughs> by themselves, so don't, don't try to get some sort of strange ideas. Um, so we talked about changing the, the roles between the driver and the navigator. 
But yeah, there is also one really, really cool thing that you can do in order to, to pair program effectively, and that is pair rotation. So I brought you basically an example, but let's say that you have, two, you have a team of four developers, developer one and two, and developer three and four. Uh, and let's start Monday, so it's a new sprint, it's a new whatever you're doing. And two guys grab the task A, or the feature A, or the user story A, and the other two guys are grabbing the task B. What I see that works really, really well, it's for instance, on Wednesday. You say, okay guys, so you finish your stand-up, or you, everybody arrived to the work, have that, ha already had the breakfast, and you're changing the pair. So as you can see here, so developer four joined developer one on task A. So let's say this is a long task that probably is going to last for the whole week. And then developer two joins developer three on a new task. And that's something really, really important because this basically fosters the, the sharing of knowledge. So instead of, let's say, these two developers only understand what task A means and these two only know what task B is, if you're changing the, the, the people, you're actually going to have more people working on the same task or on the same code base, and that's something that is really important. And besides that, obviously, you're fostering the team spirit and team communication because everybody's working with everyone, with everyone else. There is actually a pretty cool tool to allow you to do that in a, in a better way. That is a pair rotation ladder. That's, that's how Rachel Davis, that wrote an awesome book called Agile Coaching, call fit. So the idea here of this pair rotation ladder, and this is something that I already did and it works quite well, is it's, it's basically a no-brainer, right? So let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six developers from Mike, Steve, Van, Rose, and so on and so forth. And you put them like this, and then you put them over there as well. And every time a pair gets together, you mark it down. Okay? So let's say in a couple of weeks or so, what this can actually help you is you take a look at the ladder and you see, and you see that, okay, so Rose and Van already paired like three times, Henry and Steve already paired like two times, but for instance, um, Henry or Paolo never paired with Steve. So this is not a tool for you to actually to, to make everybody pair with everyone else. I think I see this much more as a tool to bring some sort of visibility to potential issues that might exist on the team. Because, well, pretty much basically, or Henry doesn't like Mike, okay? So that's something that you should probably should, should, you need to work on. Or let's say that nobody actually wants to pair with Mike, so that's something that you can probably read as well from this sort of letter. Or they actually don't pair together because it doesn't make sense, or because I don't know, and we prefer to pair with another one. So this sort of tool is basically a tracking tool, okay? So this is just to bring visibility on the team behavior. And you can actually try to take some data from it and see, okay, do I have some sort of issues on the team or not? Because as you can see, as soon as you start pairing, a lot of, of issues that probably you don't understand in solo programming come up really, really quickly. And that's about team interaction and that sort of stuff. That's why I really like this pair rotation ladder. It gives you a lot of important data. Okay, so let's say that pair, uh, pair programming is a really cool idea. Um, so, okay, so, right, pair rotation, but why? Why, why can't people actually just pair with the, the people that they like? Probably they are going to work much better. But, <clears throat> and that actually might be true, but if you don't foster this pair rotation and making sure that everybody is working with everybody else, you're going to lose this. And this is some, one of the big benefits of allowing the team to rotate in their pairs. Um, that's the collective code ownership. Because let's say if you only have the same two people working on, let's say, a service or a data layer or on the database or so, if those two guys are going away, you're going to lose that knowledge, right? And that doesn't make a lot of sense. So the idea here is make sure that everybody rotates, everybody grabs tasks from really different natures to make sure that everybody has that sense of ownership and belonging about the code. If you don't do this, what's going to happen is if let's say that some part of the code has a bug, well, that's a problem for that pair that works on that every single day, not for us. And then you kind of have the team divided. So yes, you should rotate your pair at least twice, I think twice a week, it's a reasonable number. I think that uh, rotating too much, people lose context of what they are doing, and that's not that, not that worth it. But at least two times a week is something that works pretty, pretty well. 
Um, so yes, collective code ownership is one thing that actually comes along with, uh, with rotation. The other one is the bus factor. Has everyone ever heard of the bus factor? No? Yeah, you're gonna love this one. <laughs> it's a little bit dark, by the way. So this is something that my scrum trainer t uh, taught me. So the bus factor basically is, let's pretend you have a bus and you have, I don't know, a developer that works on the database. So if the, run, the bus runs over the developer and kills him or puts him out of the hospital, something weird like that, are you going to lose the knowledge or are your team going to be slowed down because of that or no? So the idea of the bus factor is if you take a look to everything that you do, to all the single uh, steps or all the parts of your application, and you have the bus factor of one, which basically means that, okay, so for this part of the application, let's say the messaging system or the database or a web service, my bus factor is one. Basically, it means that you only have one guy that actually understands what's happening in there, and that's not good. So if you're rotating your pair or two guys, so if you're rotating everyone, what you're basically doing is you're making sure that you have a lot of people working on the same thing. So your bus factor, instead of being one or two, is actually three, four, or five. And that's really good, not because a bus is going to hit your team members, but let's say that people go on vacation, people get married, people get sick. Um, and, and yes, if you don't spread the knowledge, what basically is going to happen is your team is going to slow down or you probably can't put that user story on that sprint because you don't know how to do it. And then your product owner is going to be frustrated at you and that never ends up well. That's, that's at least my, 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 my personal experience. <coughs> and the other thing that is really, really good, and it's the, the last one of, of the benefits of, of rotation, it's the beginner's mind. Uh, so beginner's mind, um, it's basically, where every time someone joins a task, he uh, joins a task with this sort of approach. And the beginner in mind is when someone is starting a new job or a new function or a new task, it kept asking a lot of questions. Why? Really? Right? Because it's like, okay, so why are you doing this the way you're doing? So why did you took that approach? So it, it, it takes, uh, he brings a lot of questions in the, into the equation. Um, and that's something that is really good because the person that is staying on the, on, the, on the task basically is going to remember why stuff is being done the way it is, so he's recycling his memory, and the person that is actually joining is going to learn much faster. So that's, that's, that's one, one big benefit of, of actually having everyone rotating. Well, and at the very end of the day, pair, pairing, pairing programming enables you to have a much more engaged and committed team. From what I actually saw and from my personal experience, people are much more into their, their tasks, their functions, when they are pairing with someone else. So it's all about that sense of ownership, uh, sense of belonging. And you see that actually all these communications are quite, quite enhanced, so it helps a lot on the team communication. Another thing that actually pair programming does is bring a lot of value to stand-ups. Well, at least, I've been doing Scrum for a, a long, long time, and, um, and what sometimes happens is, okay, it's my turn to speak, I'm going to say what I've done yesterday, what I'm doing today, and some issues that I might have, and well, if the next developer doesn't have anything to do with my work, he's probably not going to even pay attention to what I'm saying. This is something, that this is a usual behavior that, that we all see in stand-ups. What happens with pair programming is not only the stand-up is much shorter because since you're working in pairs, only one, one, one person speaks for the pair, actually everybody pays attention because since you're rotating the pairs, you don't know on a Tuesday if you're going to end up on that user story on the Wednesday, so you're actually paying attention to what the person is saying and you're asking questions and trying to understand exactly why stuff is being done the way it is. So yes, it brings a lot of value. One thing that actually helps as well is on the integration of a new team member. On teams that actually pair program, what we usually see is that when we have a new arrival, he can actually start to code on the code base on the very first day, right? Let's say he's a driver, he has a senior developer with him being the navigator, so we know that he's not going to do something stupid or silly. So yeah, he can actually start almost on day one doing some, some, some good stuff, probably even do a commit or something like that. Uh, and usually on solo programming teams, you arrive there, you're going to spend the whole week reading some lousy manual, then you're going to spend another week probably playing on the code base in a branch that no one really cares, and probably after that you're going to start producing some serious code. So pair programming actually allows to everyone to actually speed up. The other thing that pair programming actually allows you to is to limit the work in progress. 
something that is completely natural. So instead of actually doing like Kanban that you say, oh no, you can't have more than four or five stuff in progress, what actually happens is since you have two guys on the same user story, the work in progress is almost cut into half. And you know the really importance of the work in progress, right? You're going to have less carryovers, less frustration of your team, and actually even the stories are going to be completed sooner, which is going to make that whole acceptance process is going to happen quicker on the sprint, which is really, really good. And the question that, well, you don't have a yes or no for this one. Uh, I have my, my, my vision about it. It's like, okay, so I'm doing code, uh, I'm already pair programming, so does it make sense to have code reviews? Um, well, I know some teams that actually they do it, but at least in my opinion, it's a little bit of a waste of a time because if you already have someone doing the code review every time someone is coding, it's almost like doing the same thing again, right? And you're basically stopping the whole team to look to some code. Um, if it is a code review for the whole department or cross team, yes, why not? So to make sure that everybody kind of agrees on that. But if it is just inside the team, I think it's a little bit overkill because, well, at the end of the day, it's not that necessary. Uh, so in my perspective, no, I don't think uh, you should do code reviews, so might as well just skip it and save some, some time on, on the meeting. Um, well, okay, so all of this leads somewhere. And uh, what I actually realized, and have a lot of stuff written on the internet, is that it leads to less bugs. So having two people working on the same task, on the same user story, tends to have less bugs, which is really meaningful, right? Nobody wants to have bugs in production, not even during the, 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 the sprint, it's something that is always, always annoying, but it happens, obviously, but yes, you tend to have less bugs because you have one, someone doing the code review, paying attention, which is good. People have fun. Remember, this is almost like that college assignments that we had when we are working in, uh, like in two or three. So yes, people have fun doing pair programming. It's a much more social activity instead of just being on your computer. You can actually enjoy it and, 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 and spend a good time while you're actually doing your work. You have less distractions. Uh, I think we all know these well-known weapons of, of mass distraction, right? So everybody is choosing a song or listening or viewing a funny video on YouTube, or you're actually chatting with your boyfriend or girlfriend on Facebook, uh, you know, and, and that's something that actually, actually distracts people. And at least in my, in my opinion, the development is almost like, like creating art, right? You need to have a sort of continuity for one hour, two hours to actually to get there and start working pretty well. So if you're using Facebook from time to time or YouTube, basically you're, kept, you're being kept distracted and, and you're not going to be that productive. Well, in pair programming that doesn't happen, right? Because you're not going to talk to your girlfriend on Facebook with your colleague next to you, right? Doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> it's not that wise. Um, less interruptions. Well, all developers that I know hate interruptions. Every single one of them. Um, and yeah, they are right because they want to do de development, they want to do software, they don't want to be kept uh, asking when this is going to be finished or being invited to meetings, that sort of stuff. And what I observed during the, the, the times that I actually working with the pair programming teams is that people tend to interrupt developers less. And that, 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 that has a really easy explanation because if you're interrupting someone, no, it's just one guy, right? That doesn't, it's not going to, to be that annoying. You ask him, okay, so is that going to take that long or can I actually go to this meeting? Um, but this kind of changes if you're actually stopping two guys. So not only people don't feel so tempted to actually ask you questions because you're going to have like two guys staring at you. Uh, and yes, and, and it's going to, to slow down your team. So what I see is that people tend to be left alone doing their work, which is really good. Less slacking. So one thing that I've realized is that, well, from time to time, well, writing some tests is boring, writing some documentation is super boring. And, uh, and yeah, and if we can actually kind of forget about these tasks, then yay, great, hey, I just forgot, that's it. Um, well, when you're pairing, um, that doesn't happen so often, because if you're actually not that in, in the mood to, to write that documentation, you have someone next to you kind of trying to push you in the right direction, in doing the right thing. 
So yeah, it's a little bit harder to slack when you're working in pairs than, than, than basically working by yourself. Um, and comfort zone wise, and this one is one of my favorites, um, is that okay, so you have the comfort zone of a developer, so his skill set, all his knowledge, uh, and you have uh, the other guy, okay? So usually when you actually have a pair, it's much bigger, which basically means that the developers can actually be much more uh, knowledge or skilled to deal with a task. And that's something that, that obviously the, the team w wins a lot from it because you know that that pair has a wide range of knowledge or tools to actually do their work. Instead of actually doing some work, then stop or ask for a colleague to help. Yes, something that actually works. And this is something that, it's an old saying and, and it's really, really true. Two heads think better than one. So, well, the good ideas usually come up as soon as you start talking to someone. You're probably going to figure that out by yourself and you're going to get to the idea. But if you start talking and kind of speaking about the thing, you're going to probably get there much faster than just thinking by yourself. Probably the other person is not going to say anything about it, but yeah, you're going to, as soon as you start speaking of the idea, you're going to have the better one. Um, or in uh, any other case, the other person can actually give you some tips and you can get to some sort of really good solution. So, just in case you're not convinced that pair programming is really, really awesome, I brought you two studies. So this one is a study that has been done by the awesome Alistair Cockburn, so he's one of the guys from the Agile Manifesto, and Laurie Williams, that's, that she's an investigator. And so basically what they did, I know that this is not in the work environment, this was just um, a study in the, in the academic context, but okay, so they grabbed a couple of students, did an experiment about pairing, and what they actually discovered is that instead of that idea that, okay, so if I have two guys working on the same feature, it's going to cost me twice as much, what they actually discovered is that the investment that you need to do in pair programming is just about 15% than solo programming. And with those 15% that you're actually investing, you can actually have all this so they got to the conclusion that pair programming improves the quality of design, reduces the defect, just like I told you, reduces the staffing risk. So basically, the idea of the bus factor, since you're pairing, if someone leaves your team by any reason, it's not that bad because since you're pairing, the knowledge is uh, inside the, the whole team and not in just the head of a person. It enhances technical skills because a really great moment to learn, right, and share stuff. Uh, improves team communication. Remember, you're working in pairs, and it's more enjoyable. So, okay, it doesn't look that expensive to have all this just for 15%. Microsoft, a company that I'm not that much fond of, but Microsoft uh, in 2008 did an experiment as well, and with some interesting results. So, more than 60% believe that pair programming actually worked quite well at Microsoft. Um, more than 65% felt that pair programming actually produced higher quality code. And one fourth of the guys actually believe that it's not that slow or it's not that expensive to actually do pair programming. Okay, so this is not that long ago and it wasn't Microsoft. There you go. So yeah, enough of the good stuff of pair programming. Uh, like everything else, pair programming has at least two big disadvantages that um, obviously you're going to need to kind of get into it, go to the learning curve and, and understand that nothing is perfect, right? And pair programming is far from being perfect. So I brought you here two common habits that usually we all have. So one is a really nice headset for you to enjoy some music while you're working. And the other one is, okay, you're doing something on the, le on the right and you actually have Facebook on the left so that you can actually keep chatting with your friends and, and kind of, um, plan a couple of beers at night. So yeah, doesn't work, right? If you're pairing with someone, you can actually listen to music on the headset. It doesn't make sense, right? Otherwise, you, there will be no communication. <laughs> so yeah, you can probably put some music l really low just to have, to, to, to have some sort of enjoyment, but you can use a headset for sure. 
Uh, and Facebook, again, if you don't want to share your private conversations, yes, you're not going to use Facebook. So this basically means that you're going to be kept on the zone much longer, and it's going to be much more intense than working by yourself. So yeah, all this that you guys love, and I love as well, gone. That's it. Probably on lunchtime, but besides that, doesn't make sense. You're pairing, remember? You're sharing your, your screen with someone else. So you don't have this social thing anymore. So the question, is pair programming actually for everyone? Is everybody going to enjoy and love pair programming? Uh, possibly no, not, no. It's not for everyone. You have a big learning curve in front of you. You need to, you need to be humble, you need to be kind, you need to be a little bit social. You, you need to be willing to receive feedback and give feedback. You need to, to share and to learn. Um, so yeah, there are some people that are bad at this and some people that are much more reserved. But um, yeah, I, I saw this working actually with well, the vast majority of, of, of the people. But yeah, some people actually enjoy it much more than others. Because obviously, if I like to have my headset and work on myself without speaking to anyone else at the office, well, then I'm one of these guys, basically. Yeah, it's not going to work for me. That's why that at the very end of the day, I think that this shouldn't ever be imposed. So yeah, you shouldn't be a dictator of pair programming. What I usually do at my teams is I actually advise. I motivate people to pair. But at the very end, well, it's a team decision, right? And since you know that some people are not going to enjoy it, this is something that doesn't make sense to be imposed. So people should try. And if they actually like and agree, then let them pair. That's, that's how I basically see it. So I've talked about some people having different personalities, OK? And well, from my previous experience with, uh, with teams doing pair programming, I've gathered a couple of personalities for you to have actually take a look. So, well, bef besides the, the common guy, the everyday Joe, let's call it that way, some personalities are quite exquisite, right? A little bit different than the ordinary. So you have here the soulmates, okay? So you're actually pairing with your best buddy. You love everything that he suggests. You're finishing each lines of code. Everything is perfect. It's like the honeymoon period. You enjoy it. Super, it's like, oh, awesome, I love to pair program with this guy. Well, you have the seniors, right, in the team. And that's something that is really, really good because as soon as you start pair programming with him, you're going to learn a lot. It's a moment area you can actually learn from someone that has more experience than you. Then you have the junior one. Yes, that's Justin Bieber, by the way. Uh, and yes, it's, it's something that is really important as well, right? It's like, it's the moment for you to mentor, to teach, to, make, to, to help someone to actually grow, and that's something that is rewarding. So besides doing your work, you're actually helping your colleague as well, and that's something that is really rewarding. With the newbies, so that's something that we already kind of talked about, so yes, you're going to help him to, to catch up really, really quickly. He's going to bombard you with a lot of whys, and you're going to actually understand why you're doing, or kind of remember why you're doing stuff the way you are. And then this is one of my personal favorites. You're actually going to pair with the guys that I call the CVDD. So this is like the CV-driven development. So he actually doesn't care about the technologies that the team uses. He just wants to grab every bleeding edge that's out there so he can actually put it on LinkedIn and look good and grab another job. So yes, so if you're actually working on, I don't know, some technology, he's probably going to grab something that is really, really new just so that he can actually have the experience to work on that. But you can actually have even more exquisite personalities. <laughs> and these ones are probably even harder that, than, than, to pair with than the other ones before. So you have the grumpy one, right? So it's that guy that's always on a bad mood, that doesn't like to, to mingle in the team. So yes, it's not that easy to pair with someone that is grumpy. Well, you have the bully, right? The badass. So it's basically the guy that's going to tell you what to do and, well, you, well, he's a bully, so he might as well just do it, and that's it. Well, so he's the asshole of the office. And it's not easy to pair with someone like that, because if you're actually trying to get some sort of agreement, well, if he's a bully, it's not going to end up well. 
You have the rock star, so okay, so the guy that has the God complex and thinks that he knows everything, so for him, pairing is almost like a waste of time, or you should be thankful every day for pairing with him, and it's a little bit annoying. And last but not least, the guy that you probably hate, and I'll, I, we, we are not of a, we are all un, uh, unperfect, we always have our arch enemies, and yes, if it is on your team, you're going to pair with him, like it or not, so yeah. Something that, that might be tricky. It can be done, so don't, don't get frustrated. Don't, don't think, oh, okay, so yeah, might as well forget it. But yeah, it's going to take some time and a lot of work. Don't think this is going to be easy because it's not. So I'm just kind of setting the expectations here. Uh, so yeah, a couple of questions that people usually do to me and I kind of try to, to wrap it up here. So first of all, and this is something that, that tells a lot or it's really meaningful for us that we are in Spain or in Portugal. And, um, and usually we, have, we work for a company that, that works abroad, that lives abroad or, stay, or is, has its main office abroad. And, um, and yes, yeah, so you have some guys over there, you have some guys over here. So does remotely works? Yes, it works fine. You have Skype, you have Google Hangouts, you have tons of tools for, uh, for screen sharing. So this, yes, it's something that, that works. Um, well, back in London, we didn't have a, 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 a tracking, a electronic tracking tool like Jira or Rally. So we just had like a physical board, and basically what we did was we grab a card, we show to the to the webcam, and say, "Hey, David, I'm going to work on this user story now. Here's are the specs. So let's keep on working." So yes, yeah, so remotely works fine. Something that works. It's easier, obviously, if you are both on the same office, but it can be done. Are estimations affected? Um, well, it really depends, right? So if you're using points, I would say no. Well, the complexity is more or less the same, right? Depending on if you're just having one person or 10 guys doing the same thing. Well, it's complexity. Uh, if you're actually do, uh, uh, doing estimations with time, you can act, you, what you need to change is instead of man days, you should have pair days, okay? So it's a kind of a, a slightly change to make this work. So what about size or length of the task? Does it make sense to pair all the time if the task only takes like five minutes? Yes, yes. Because if you have just one guy doing the task over the five minutes, remember the bus is going to hit him and then you, nobody else on the team knows how to do that task in five minutes. So yes, pair all the time. Don't, don't waste time actually trying to figure out if that doesn't make sense to be paired or not. Just, just pair, that's it. And if the task is big, even better. If the task is quite short, then no harm done. That's it. So what about the money, right? So this is probably the thing that all the managers don't like about pair programming. It's that in theory, it costs the double of the, of the, of the money, right? You have two salaries working on the same task. But from what you actually saw here, so you're going to have less bugs in production. You're going to have less technical debt because you're going to have much more quality on your code or more quality on your code. You're going to foster communication, collaboration, knowledge sharing on the team. What's the price on that, right? So that's it. If you actually kind of try to put some sort of value on all these items, probably you'll get to the conclusion that it is not that much more expensive. Is it only for mature teams? So okay, so I'm gathering a new team. Does it make sense actually to, to have this on just mature teams? On new teams, does it make sense? I believe exact on the opposite. It's for new teams, it's much easier to start pair programming since they don't have any sort of routines than probably on a team that's really mature and then you need to change and you know how people love changes, not. <laughs> so, so yes, uh, it's much easier to actually implement pair programming on new teams. Obviously in mature teams it's, it's possible, but it's a little bit harder than, than on, on new teams. Does it scale? Yes, it scales fine. Uh, back in London, we were more than, I don't know, around 120 developers, all of them pairing. And besides actually rotating in the team, like we saw uh, a couple of slides ago, we actually make them rotate between teams, which is even more powerful. Um, so yes, it scales fine. So it really doesn't matter how big your company is. You can all do pair programming. Okay, so companies that use it. Well, if you actually take a closer look, you're going to see that a couple of big companies do it. They are out there. They are quite successful. 
we saw that presentation from Angel Medinilla saying, oh yeah, I want to be like Spotify, I want to be like Google, I want to be like this and like that. Yeah, so here you go. You have Facebook, you have eBay. They're all doing pair programming. If you actually want to copy good practices, why not? Tons of people are talking about pair programming. So I talked about Alistair Cockburn. You have the fathers of extreme programming as well, Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries. Um, you have guys from, from, uh, from, from the US. Uh, you have Mitch Lacey, my scrum trainer. I'm a big fan and probably, hopefully, you'll be someday. So, okay, you're all, let's pretend you're all convinced that pair programming is the best thing ever. So how can you actually start doing this? Well, what I usually say is, you can start slow, okay? You don't need to jump into it on the very first day, right? It's, it's almost like Scrum. You don't need to jump into Scrum like completely, like take the leap of faith. You can start slow. You can probably grab a pilot, grab a team, and, do, and start doing pair programming. Or let's say you just have one team, so just have a pair. Or let's say that you have uh, the pairing on Fridays or just on the mornings, I don't know. So you can actually start slow. It's something that you can try to experiment and try to, to take a look to the results of pairing, the results of solo programming, and figure out what's best for you. Or obviously, just go for it, yeah. Just say, okay guys, so we are all pair programming for let's say three sprints, and then it's not going to close our business for sure. So let's take a look at what's going to happen, and if we are going to go slower, if what happens to bugs, if we're going to be reduced or not. Let's see about team communication, if people are getting along better or not. So yeah, it's something that's to you to actually decide. So yeah, this is pretty much it. Uh, I love this sentence that basically kind of says everything about pair programming. That the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and that's why I think that we work all better together if we are working with someone else than just by ourselves. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions, anyone? Uh, if you want to actually do the question in Spanish, uh, I promise I reply in English because <laughs> my Spanish is a little bit awful. But uh, yeah, I think I understand it perfectly. So if you, can, if you want to do it in English, it's fine. If you want to do it in Spanish, it's fine as well. So if you have any questions, just, just go ahead. Otherwise, we can go to the keynote. But yeah, that gentleman over there. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. It's easier. Okay, uh, you said always work with one computer, which mm -hmm. I think, of course, it's the only option, but yeah. uh, what happens in the case where you have to stop for a while just for research on Google or Stack Overflow or whatever? Mm -hmm. It's not maybe better to have another computer just to split the search, or what do you think? Yeah, it's better um, to keep focus on one computer and one search. Yeah, usually, let's say, if you're investigating something on Stack Overflow, it's good to have both people actually looking at stuff instead mm -hmm. of just one person looking at it. Because you know, sometimes someone sees something that the other one is not seeing, or I take a look at the solution and the other person is uh, understanding it completely different. So yes, I think that just one computer is fine. Uh, one thing that I actually saw that's useful to have at least a laptop for, for each developer is when you're actually checking emails or something like that, right? Because if you're on one workstation, you're logged in into just one account. So if, let's say, that a, one of the developers receive an email from, I don't know, the product owner, stakeholder, something like that, then it's useful to actually have the laptop. But even that, you have your smartphone. Usually, you have the email over there. So well, you just need a workstation at the end of the day. But if your developers have one more computer, I think it's, it's not useful to use it like, uh, like regularly, because otherwise, you'll be tempted to go there. Uh, and Stack Overflow and Facebook and that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't kill you anyway, so why not? Okay. Thank you. Cool. Well, <laughs> uh, you said that the, all, the, all the, the pairs mm -hmm. uh, are rotating, but GitHub or any kind of code repository, it doesn't it is not prepared to work in teams. That yeah. What do you have? An account for, for every combination or no, just uh, one account? Yeah, it depends on the person that logs in on the computer in the morning, right? Because well, at the very end of the day, it's almost like, I, I don't know if you guys use Rally or Jira, 
by the way, I'm not a big fan of those tools, but yeah, but usually they may test to it and okay. And even on those tools, if you're working on a task or user store, you only have a username to put in there. But at the end of the day, who cares, right? It's like, okay, so if something goes wrong on the, on, on the, on the code on that commit, you might as well have all the team jumping into there and try to figure out what's happened instead of just one guy. And usually that person is going to remember who was pairing with him anyway. So yeah, it's, it's something that, yes, tools are not ready for that, but um, I don't think that you should ever uh, not adopt a practice because of a tool. <laughs> Because I'm not a, at least on these sort of electronic tools and rallies and stuff, I'm not a big fan. I quite hate them. Uh, but yeah, it's like, okay, it's not prepared for that, but who cares at the end of the day, right? If, if the practice works, then let the tools adapt to you and not you adapt to the tools. That's, that's, that's what I think. Uh, what happens if one of the developers is more senior than the other? Uh, they have to, they should share uh, half the time or the senior should be most of the time in control? Uh, well, it really depends. So what, what I usually see is um, when the senior is being the navigator, is giving, pointing to the right direction, giving the tips, which is really good. When the senior is being the driver, what I see that usually happens is when he's coding, he's saying what he's going to do and why. So it's something that is really interesting. So I'm kind of doing my stuff and I'm, I'm speaking at the same time, saying, okay, so now I'm going to create a class that is going to do this and that and I'm going to call this service this way. So it's something that, that, that's good. So when you're actually pairing with someone that has a really different experience from you, the most experience should be much more vocal than the other person and that, that actually helps a lot. That's, that's how I see it. Thank you. Uh, how do you adapt the environment for uh, pair programming? Because I, I was wondering if you are all the time talking each other, mm -hmm. the, the environment w would be very noisy. noisy. Yeah, uh, yeah, sometimes. But again, if we are kind of sitting both of us here and you're not shouting, usually it's something that, that works pretty well. So um, whenever teams are pairing, I don't see a lot of, of of problems in, in them having to speak. Because one thing that, for instance, even at the portal office, every time you go down the corridor, all, everyone is kind of speaking or laughing or so. So when that two guys are actually talking, and well, if I'm working with you on this workstation, we are sit next to each other, it's something that is not that disturbing. So at least until now, I never, I never saw it like something that I should be really concerned. Uh, but again, I think it's just a matter of, I don't know, let's say that, okay, so if you have a pair here, don't have a pair here, probably here, so kind of keep a little bit of distance between the, the, the pairs, and it should work fine. Thank you. How would you deal with uh, long tasks assignment and mm -hmm. understanding long tasks, uh, something like one day long or so? Mm -hmm. Isn't it like, Oh God, we are changed forever, you and me. Uh, yeah. How, how uh, often would you rotate? Yeah, so usually what I do is I like to rotate twice a week, okay? So regardless of the size of the task, we start on the Monday, we rotate on the Wednesday, and that's, so basically one of the pairs stays for like two days, and the other pair stays for three, right? Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, usually what happens is if the user story is really big, let's say it's going to take the whole week, that to me it's, it's really, really good. Obviously, I don't agree on big user stories, but that's a different story. But it, when that happens, let's say that you can actually, you can't split the user story, uh, you're going to have at least three guys working on the same user story, so that's something that is good for you. Um, if the user story is not that big, well, basically, let's say on the Wednesday, someone is going to start working on you. But the thing on, on the rotation that you, you probably saw on the, on the um, on the slide that I, sh that I showed was, you shouldn't take the full pair out of that task. So when you're going to rotate, one of the guys is staying on that user story, and the other person is going to leave and let an another person join. Because on that moment, you're going to have someone that is going to give context, and is going to explain why and basically where we are on that user story, and that, that really works. Um, be, well, be the problem with never ending user stories, I think, well, in solo programming, you have that as well. Um, I think it's just a matter of on the rotation, making sure that you just rotate one guy and not the two. Otherwise, well, you're going to lose all the context and nobody's going to understand 
why stuff is done the, the way it is. That's pretty much it. Done? Okay. Thank you, everyone.